Welcome into Ion Northeast Kansas, the podcast. Glad you're giving us a listen as we recap some of the top interviews from Ion Northeast Kansas, the television show. I'm your host, Melissa Bruner. You can watch us streaming live Monday through Friday, 4 o'clock Central Time from the capital of Kansas on WIBW.com. Had a lot of fun things going on this week. Part of the week focused on the late U.S. Senator from Kansas, Bob Dole. A lot of activities are going on to honor him. Saturday, July 22nd would have been Senator Dole's 100th birthday. The day before that milestone event, Washburn University is going to celebrate its own milestone, dedicating its new law school building, which is named in Senator Dole's honor. Washburn University President Dr. Julian Mazachak visited the Red Couch to let us know a bit about what that new facility is going to mean for the university. Dole Hall, the new law school building. You're hoping those storms are out of here by tomorrow afternoon. We are. What are the big festivities you have planned? So tomorrow afternoon, our large festivity starts at 3 o'clock. We have uh, elected officials, our governor and both Senator Marshall and Senator Moran will be there along with other dignitaries and people who made the, the project possible to cut the ribbon on our brand new academic building, the law, our brand new law school that we have named in honor of one of our most um, honored and, and highly reputable uh, alumni of both our undergraduate and law school, uh, Senator Robert Dole. Very cool. And do you plan, will any members of the Dole family be able to be there tomorrow? Yes, we are so excited. Robin Dole will be able to be with us on Friday for this uh, momentous and once in a lifetime occasion. Yeah, how big of a deal is this? What is this new facility like? What does it mean to Washburn Law's program? So this is a brand new from the ground up designed to be a state of the art program and a building with all of the technology that you need today to teach and for students to learn in classrooms that are filled with natural light and give them an opportunity to be in the spaces where they can interact and connect. And then we also have two uh, courtrooms that are in this. We have a little bit of video of the yeah, building oh, good, if we want to show a little bit oh, of it because be yeah, the, the big floor to ceiling, windows and, then, and everything and yes. the courtrooms. What do the courtrooms mean? So we have um, we have two. We have a trial courtroom and we have an appellate courtroom okay. and um, they are they are designed specifically for those types of court experiences. The students will be able to learn in them. They'll be able to practice in them. And so we're very excited about that. That is something that is different than the previous law school. Uh, we also have a tremendous uh, mural that's in the entrance. I don't know if that's in your video or not that commemorates our role. Uh, Washburn, as you know, has always been about education for all and the law school is no different. Didn't matter your gender, your race, your socioeconomic background. You had a place at Washburn. That is true for our law school and we have a mural that commemorates Brown v. Board and some hmm. of those other other um, types of things, principles that we have related to our, our core mission. I found it interesting as the planning for this project went on. It started as one thing, of mm -hmm. course, then we had a pandemic hit, but because of that, you were able to kind of reshape what the project actually we looked did. like to respond to, as, as you've talked about, what today's students want and need and are mm -hmm. actually doing. Mm -hmm. So th th that's a great reason why sometimes a long project actually ends up with a better project. This is a great example. We started this project and started envisioning it well before the uh, pandemic and also well before a lot of the technology advancements that we've made in the last 12 years. And so we were able to kind of redesign the building right before we were ready to build. And we were able to create the state of the art type of building that we need today, not you, what we needed 12 years ago. You now need a leader for this building. We do. Dr. Jeffrey Jackson is right, interim yes. dean. So what happens, well, how is the search going for a permanent dean? So I will tell you, we haven't started yet. And the reason is I wanna say interim Dean Jackson is doing a great job and I am grateful that they waited to fill any positions until they found out who the new president was and, I, and they waited for me to be here. <laughs> and so what happens though in higher ed is there's a certain time of year in the academic year that's the best time to look for your new leaders and to do a search and uh, we're about ready to embark upon that time in the fall. And so we will be working on doing a national search for our new dean. Well, we will wait and stay tuned when it comes to that and all the different hiring processes that are going on. Any 
early returns. I know you don't get official enrollment numbers in for another couple we months, don't. but any early returns on what it's looking like the new Shawnee County Scholarship Program is going to mean for the numbers in this freshman class? Yeah. So what I can tell you is it is too early for numbers. <laughs> However, we have um, evidence that people are so excited about this scholarship and we've heard from high school counselors, we've heard from high school principals and superintendents about how excited they are about this and how they personally know students who are going to be able to go to college that could not go to college without that scholarship. And we've seen some of those, we'll see if they enroll. <laughs> I mean, I saw, so we're always right. careful about what we say, but we have, the, the response has been tremendous. And we know that those scholarship programs have changed lives and that we're going to have students at Washburn because of them. Well, you probably will have a segment of people, not just deciding to go to college at all, but then also, I know in my own family, I've heard mm -hmm. some conversations and, and in friends and things about, well, maybe we need to change. If they were debating between a couple schools, this maybe has tipped the scales in yeah. Washburn's favor. We have a few of those too. <laughs> yes. Well, we'll yes, wait to we see do. when the numbers come out and we will, of course, be there in covering Washburn Law Thank School's you. building dedication yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, we're so excited. Thank you. Thank you so very much for being here. And of course, if you missed any of our coverage of the dedication of Washburn University Law School, you can see that on WIBW.com as well as on our WIBW TV 13 News YouTube channel. Be sure to click subscribe while you're there as well. Continuing the Senator Dole theme after our visit with Dr. Mazachak, we also had with us Glenda Dubois. She is the statewide director for Kansas for AARP and Audrey Coleman. She is the current director of the Dole Institute of Politics located on the University of Kansas campus. 20 years ago is when Senator Dole himself was on campus to dedicate that facility and they have big celebrations planned. They were going to have a huge celebration for the 20th anniversary of the Dole Institute of Politics on what would have been the late senator's 100th birthday. And it was. It was a big day 20 years ago. It was a ago. big day. It was a big week. It, it was, was fanfare. Yes, a whole <laughs> lot of ceremonies. But tomorrow, or Saturday, rather, is when you have the big plans. For those, who, first of all, who aren't familiar, Audrey, with the Dole Institute of Politics, sure. what is it? Yeah, the, the Dole Institute of Politics is a wonderful facility with Bob Dole's personal archives and also Senator Elizabeth Dole. We have a beautiful museum gallery, and we've been, as you say, and, and, and we're celebrating our 20th anniversary. We're a, a place where we're dedicated to civility, bipartisanship, and civil discourse. And we have wonderful programs for students at KU and the general public, people of all ages. We're, I like to say we're about as, we're on par with the U.S. Presidential Library. System. I love the American flag stained glass oh, it's in the gorgeous. lobby. It's so impressive. What do you have planned for Saturday? Yeah, well, we have a full slate of family-friendly programming, but we're gonna kick off at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, with Governor Kelly and Robin Dole will be with us as well. We've actually kicked off our, our, right. our festivities many, many weeks ago in April. Uh, Linda and yes. uh, our friends at ARP Kansas were with uh, Trent, Senators Trent Lott and Tom Daschle oh, wow. in April when we broke ground uh, with artist Stan Hurd uh, on an earthwork, tribute mm -hmm. earthwork to Senator Bob Dole. So that is going to be uh, dedicated in our ceremony on the uh, uh, on Saturday, on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And how does AARP fit into all of this, Glenda? Well, AARP has a long history of really supporting veterans and their families. In AARP, we have over 6 million members that are veterans. And here in Kansas, we have close to 200,000 that are, are military families. So that's part of our legacy and part of our history. So it is just really very, very natural for us to be a part of this celebration because we want to lift up the legacy of Senator Bob Dole and what he stood for, and then also be able to partner and celebrate the um, 20th year anniversary of the Dole Institute of Politics. Well, we do have, I told you, Audrey, you'd enjoy seeing this. Oh, we do have a video wait. from 20 years ago. Um, I'm not sure if this is exactly the story that I did, but there is <coughs> Senator Dole 20 years ago at the celebration to dedicate uh, the Institute yes. of Politics. and. Uh, Former President Jimmy Carter was there, <laughs> Condoleezza Rice was there. Uh, it, it was a uh, fan, and, and veterans were a big part of it. They were always so front and center. And Glenda, how much does it help AARP in your work with veterans, the work of Senator Dole and the Elizabeth Dole Foundation when it comes to caregivers and the support they offer? Exactly, well, what, what we've done, we actually partner and collaborate with the Dole Foundation through their Dole Fellows, Fellows Program. So we really want to provide support for them. And AARP actually has four pillows that we work around to really support and empower veterans. And those are caregiving, it's uh, fraud, 
information for mm -hmm. them. It's all about the work and jobs for them and also really kind of connecting them to their resources. So we serve as that connector and convener of those services to help them to get where that what they need. For example, we even had a telethon a few weeks ago about the PACT Act that really mm -hmm. we want to be able to be sure that they know about it and that they are connected so that they can get their services. So we really work to provide those resources, the information, and any support that we can to them because they're very much a priority for us. And Andre, how much will veterans yes. and the military history be incorporated into Saturday's yeah. celebration? Well, we're so pleased. Uh, the the former, formal ceremony in the morning, we're going to have the color guard, the Fort Leavenworth color guard will, will help us kick it off. And then we have the 312th uh, loaded brass uh, quintet from Lawrence, Kansas, mm -hmm. the reserve man. Yeah. And then we all are going to have a, a flyover from uh, some folks in the Randolph, Texas uh, is going to, we have four T-38 talents coming over the dole. That will be in the afternoon. So you're really hoping for the weather to be good. The veterans, it's going to be great. And, and, and you <laughs> mentioned our, our salute to our, the greatest generation uh, when, when the Institute was founded. And it's so much a part of our mission is working on the next generation you know yes. in the in the in the image of senator dole in the image of, of senator elizabeth dole working to build leadership uh with them as inspiration for the future your vip guest list saturday <laughs> oh we've got uh governor governor kelly and robin dole uh in the afternoon at one o'clock we have former speechwriters two former speechwriters oh, for for uh, bob and elizabeth dole carrie timchuk is going to be giving a program uh, at the lead center just across the parking lot about the wit and wisdom of bob dole and we you know we all miss that <laughs> you had to appreciate you know, remember it, when right? politics yeah. was fun and funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 20th anniversary celebration. If you would like to head on over to the KU campus, 10 o'clock are those tributes, the earthwork dedication, 11 to 5, an open house. 3 o'clock, they're going to serve up some birthday treats and that historic flyover should be happening about 4 o'clock. So head on over. It's just off uh, near the lead Center area-ish yeah, of the yeah, KU yeah, campus yeah. is where yeah. we're talking about. Yeah. Thank you both for being Thank here, you. ladies. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, if you're catching this podcast after July 2nd, you can find that video coverage on WIBW.com and our WIBW YouTube channel as well. Shawnee County Commissioner Bill Rippon paid a visit to the studio, and as he was updating us about budget talks and those sorts of things, he also let us know about a unique approach that Shawnee County's Noxious Weeds Department is taking when it comes to combating those weeds in some tough-to-reach areas. Take a listen. One of the big things is you're adding your own little piece to the skies yes. <laughs> with the way that you're approaching noxious weeds. You started a drone program. How does that work? Okay, we have a, a drone that does spraying, and this really helps us out in areas where we have like unsure footing, where you have a, a rocky embankment. Maybe you want to spray over a pond, uh, muddy areas or cliffs, and things like that. The drones can go in where it was very difficult for people with a backpack sprayer. When did this start? Uh, last year, we started uh, the drone spraying. And a, a, one of these drones can do like uh, 15 to 20 acres in an hour, where uh, normally in a, in, in a rough situation like that, it might take somebody half a day to spray that area. How does it work? Did you, and did there, was there any extra skill requirements here in order to get this started? Oh yes, uh, we had to have a licensed drone pilot to fly these things. You use a little joystick to, mm -hmm. to fly them. Uh, but uh, yeah, and, and they use GPS tracking. So these drones can go out and spray an area and then when it's empty, it'll fly back, you fill it back up, it goes back right where it left off and starts spraying in. So you don't have any overlap or, or mist strips and things like that. How big of an issue are noxious weeds around the area? You know, it's important to keep the noxious weeds down, especially for the farmers. Uh, you can get some of these weeds and they're very invasive and they can kind of take over farmland and things like that. So we try to stay on top of them. And if people actually see a report where they think this is something that needs to be taken care of in an area that they're in, where do they call to report noxious weeds in the first place? Uh, they can call our noxious weed department, Shawnee County, and uh, uh, let them know about it. Not just tall grass, you're talking actual noxious weeds. Certain things are on a list that qualify. Oh yes, we have a number of weeds that are, that are on there. And there's some grasses too. We, we have uh, uh, an invasive grass that we've been fighting too. Uh, but. Uh, there, there's a lot of plants that, are, that get introduced to the area that aren't, aren't natural to the area and they just tend to take over. So you want to stay on top of those. All the various practical uses for drones just fascinate me. It so when I saw that, I'm like, really? You're using <laughs> drones to spray weeds? Very cool. You've also been in the middle of budget hearings. When did those start and what is the headline that you see coming out of it so far? Okay, uh, we started back uh, July 3rd. And, and through the 11th, we were doing budget hearings. And budget hearings, uh, they were open to the public, but we listened to each department head and they, they gave us their uh, presentation of what they think it's gonna take uh, for 2024. 
We also listen to the not, uh, not-for-profit not groups uh, like Helping Hands Humane Society, Vallejo, uh, TARC, places like that. They, they come and do a presentation as well. Uh, next, uh, we will be, uh, we'll be going into looking at the CIP, that's Capital Improvement Projects. These are large projects, usually over $100,000 and things that, that are going to last at least 10, 15 years and we'll start on that next Monday. It usually takes a couple days to wade through all the capital improvement projects. And then uh, on the 21st of August, we'll have an open public hearing where people can voice their opinions about the budget. And, uh, and then at that time, we will probably approve the budget and, uh, and set the mill levy. On that August 21st, or are you expecting well, September before it that? May, oh, September, I'm sorry, yeah. But uh, <laughs> August 21st is where we'll have the public public meeting where people can come in. And then a couple weeks after that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where are the greatest areas of increased need where we might see expenditures go up, whether that be because actual expenses went up or because we see a need and we need to spend more in that area? Um, you know, I, I think percentage-wise, uh, our planning department, we need to add another person there. Uh, you know, we're going to take on some more responsibilities and planning, it looks like, so uh, uh, we, we need to gear up there a little bit. Of course, they're mainly just salaried people. They don't have a lot of things. Uh, you, you take places like Parks and Rec and, and, uh, and Public Works, they're doing projects, and it's kind of hard to compare the different uh, the different departments and their but needs. But do you want money from new projects? Like, will oh, yes. we see new Parks and Rec projects? Will oh, yes. we see new mental health programs? Uh, Yes, we'll probably see, I don't know about mental health programs, but uh, we'll see new park projects and public work projects for sure. When you, you, you briefly mentioned the mill levy there, is the goal to keep it the same or to reduce it? Because as we all know, valuations went up. So even if you keep the mill levy the same, you're going to generate more money. The person who owns yeah. the same house, if that value went up, mill levy the same, they're going to have a higher bill. So yeah. where, where are we at in the mill levy? We're going to try to hold the line, just keep it even. If, and if we can drop it a little bit, we'll go, we're going to try to do that. The problem we have in the county is whatever the problem that everybody has, it's, it's high inflation mm -hmm. and then uh, salaries going up. And you know, to, to attract people to work in our different positions and to retain people, we've had to stay in line with everybody else in the private sector. Well, August 21st, if you have strong feelings either way, that's the day to let commissioners know about it because they need to hear from you in order to make their decision. Yeah. Bill right. Ripon, appreciate you being here and explaining where you're at in the process Thank and the you. drones that you might see attack in wheat. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> I know drones themselves aren't new, but I still am always fascinated when I hear of all the different ways people are using them to increase efficiencies or to take a really new approach to a, a long-standing issue. So thanks to Commissioner Rippon for letting us know about that. There is a new festival coming to Topeka. It is called For the Culture Kansas. Rodney Harmon and Renita Harris visited the studio to tell us what it's all about. <laughs> I love the idea of this, Rodney. What is the, the idea behind the festival and, and what you hope to do? Okay, we hope to just bring everybody together to understand that, you know, to celebrate the African American culture, uh, understand our heritage, and uh, let everybody come together and understand that basically we're all one mm -hmm. and we're all could come together and celebrate as one. It is not just for African Americans, it's for everyone to come in and, and share in this. Uh, celebration. And what kind of um, events, activities are going to be included in that celebration that you hope to highlight? Okay. Uh, Renita will talk about the gala, which will start off the fest, but on Friday night, uh, we have a lot of different uh, artists. You know, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have a lot of different artists. So Friday this is night. This the last weekend of July, just to yes. be clear, not this yes. weekend. Last weekend in July. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it'd be July 27th, starts the gala, 28th, 29th, and 30th, the actual fest. So on Friday, it'll be from 4 to 9 down at Evergy Center, uh, Evergy Plaza, sorry. And uh, we will have start off with introduction of our board members, introduction of city councils, you know, introduction of the state people. Um, then we would go into Saturday morning. Saturday morning, we'll kick off from nine in the morning. We kick off with a yoga and a fitness thing at nine, mm -hmm. which then goes in at 10 o'clock to a health panel. And then at 11 o'clock, it goes into a business panel. Then at one o'clock, we kick off the festivities again with music up through nine o'clock. Uh, our uh, headline speaker or headline artist is Jershika Maples. Uh, she's number 
five, I believe, on uh, Voice, that, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Voice 21, uh, the Voice 21. And then Sunday brings what sorts of things? Sunday brings also uh, from 11 to 7 or 11 to 6, it brings another kickoff, a gospel. Ah. So we're doing a uh, gospel uh, that's we called it Joyful Sunday. A lot of music, a lot of yeah. entertainment, yes. but it all starts with the gala. So Renita, what is that going to involve? Okay, so the uh, gala is on July the 27th uh, from uh, five o'clock to 11. We will be at the Townsite Plaza. We will have um, a, um, a couple of speakers. We have Eugene Williams, which is a um, former seven times Emmy um, broadcaster. We have Maggie Anderson, who was out of Chicago, and she has she's the author of the uh, book um, by, by Black. Black. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, um, we also have auction. We will have good food and celebrate. You know, do a little dancing, and we will also give out scholarships that evening. Oh, scholarships are fun, and it's always fun to have dancing. Right. <laughs> and so, and I also would like to thank our sponsors for our gala: um, um, CBW Bank and HEB Construction. And then we, you know, like to thank Townside Plaza for letting us, you know, have our event at their venue. Why are you so excited for this festival, Renita? Well, I think it's a good time to celebrate, you know, to celebrate everyone, the summer and all. I, I just love summer. And so I, um, I'm looking forward to bringing a lot of audience to yes. Topeka. I yeah. mean, it's going to be a lot of, you know. I love that this whole month of July, we have Fiesta Topeka next week celebrating yes. our Mexican neighbors. Yes. We have our, the For the Culture Kansas at the end of the month yes. celebrating our black and African-American right. neighbors. It's just yes. so much rich history and heritage. Yes. And you're right, Rodney, you said it best. If we all just get together, yeah. we're one community. We really That's are. Right. We discover yes. how alike we are. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I love it. So if you would like to attend the Black Tie Gala, first of all, is taking place July 27th. The festival at Evergy Plaza is then the next three days, the 28th, 29th, and 30th. Okay. Some great entertainment, some great information planned. If you'd like tickets for the gala, go to fortheculturekss.org. There's a link to buy the tickets there. And the festival itself, Rodney, those workshops, the entertainment, is that all free? Everything is free, free. except for the gala. It. Except oh. for the gala. Awesome. Everything and we is have free. seven we have... tables left. Yes. So. Ooh, so get your tickets yes. now. Get your tickets Thank now. Thank you both for being all here. Right. I appreciate Thank you your Thank you, in the rain yes. to come on out. <laughs> yeah, I should mention we're laughing a little bit at the end there because Rodney and Renita made the drive in in the middle of really some like massive rainstorms, heavy rain and 70 miles mile an hour winds. It left a lot of limb damage around the capital city, which everybody has been cleaning up all week. So they were real troopers for coming out in the middle of that rainstorm. And be sure to look forward to the For the Culture Kansas Festival coming up at the end of July in Topeka. Before we go, I want to share a fun visit from this week. There is a group called Carswell and Hope. They say they've got a vintage rock sound with an Irish twist. They were part of the Noto Summer Concert Series in the North Topeka Arts and Entertainment District. The concert Concert itself is Friday evening, so you might be listening after that. And if you missed the concert, that's why I wanted to share this segment with you. These guys are a lot of fun, and they performed a little bit for us as well. Nick Carswell and Jason Sloat are two of the band's members. They are here with us, and obviously you got lucky enough that you put your name in the band. Sorry, Jason. It's not meant to be a slight to you. <laughs> no, not exactly. How many are there of you total? Well, we, ha we have four core, five, we sometimes swell to seven or eight <laughs> around uh, some of the bigger stages we get to get on. Yeah, we have some, a lot of collaborators, we're and very I'm, lucky. I'm hearing it a little bit now, Nick. Where <laughs> did you get your sound from? What did, what, how would you describe your music? Uh, not very well, I don't describe it very well. Uh, we're a good <laughs> mix of uh, rock. We kind of have, uh, my songwriting has a lot of folk roots to it, so the songs still kind of come from acoustic guitar a lot of the time or me and a piano, but we're, we always try and strive to make these bigger sounds um, and yeah, explore our sound. And you uh, come by the Irish honestly. Yes. What is your background there? Yeah, I, actually 12 years ago today, July 19th, uh, my wife and I arrived uh, in Lawrence, Kansas from Ireland. Yeah, we just, she had a job, we just moved over and yeah, 12 years later, I don't yeah. know how that happened. Happy Americaniversary, I guess is what we call it today. Kansasversary, we've, we've no, we come to call it, yeah. <laughs> and Jason, how did you end up being part of this musical scene? Well, uh, about 12 years ago, I was, I, I play drums in a variety of groups and I was playing an outdoor show, a little jazz combo on the street, and this Irish fella walked up to me and said, hey, you want to be in my band? And I said, uh, okay. And next thing you know, we have Carswell and Hope. 
-hmm. And here you are. And Where does the are. hope come from? You hope they stick with you? There, what? <laughs> we Very good. We hope you like it. That, that's you a know? great answer. We hope answer, you like it. You know? I like it. I well, like it. I like the idea of, you know, maybe a fictional okay. pairing of songwriters, some of the great classic songwriters, pairs of them, Simon and Garfunkel, the Gershwins was, was another uh, inspiration. But yeah, just adding, and yeah, it's a good word to be associated with. And is this your latest CD? That is, yeah, Sign of the Times. Yeah. Uh, last All original? All original, yeah. This was most of this was completed during the pandemic, so it was kind of a couple of years worth of <laughs> uh, weird, uh, weird times in the studio and recording at home. Um, yeah, so, so it's truly is sign of the times, it, right? Do yeah. you guys have day jobs? Uh, yeah, we both work for the University of Kansas. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, are you in the music department, or are you in some other strange areas that make you go and you do music on the side? Right. Uh, well, Jason works at Kansas Public Radio. That's right. Ah. I'm a recording engineer, and I work with music, and uh, so I'm a, I'm a broadcaster as well. Nice. I like it. And, and in the same building, we have Audio Reader, which is an audio yes. information service for uh, visually impaired folks, print disabled. Yeah. And so. you work with that. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. cool. Very cool. So you have a show coming up, Noto. When is it? What is it? And who's with you? Yeah, Friday night at the uh, Red Boat Park in Noto in the Arts District. We have a fantastic uh, performer opening the show for us, Bristol Carr. So she's going to play about an hour. And, and she's then. a local high school student, which All I think right. is super cool. Yeah, yeah. We love uh, encouraging more folks to come into music, and we'll try and not dissuade her or put her <laughs> off. But <laughs> now, it, we love having, you know, collaborating like that with a, with a great outdoor event with a public invited family and all that. So, yeah, yeah and then we'll play a couple hours after that. And the we? weather is going to be beautiful. That you've been over there and you've submitted your order for Jeremy. I did. I, I asked him to make sure the weather's good and yeah. thumbs up. So. <laughs> well, we want to give a little taste of what people will hear in Redbud Park on yeah. Friday. So if you don't mind, Carswell and Hope, thank you so very much. And let us hear what you got. Yeah, yeah just take that over your shoulder. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're wires. good. Yeah, wires everywhere. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> Abilene, your friend of mine. Since I wrote your name in a book I've had for the longest time Off and on, you're a mystery You're a truck stop queen on a jukebox screen Something else to see local Never student is their you. opening act. You will enjoy it all. It is all free for you to see. 7 o'clock Friday night, Red Bud Park. Another fantastic event in Noto. So again, that concert was Friday the 21st, so you may be listening after that, but that's why we have this segment, so that you can go on and take a listen and watch it as well. Again, the video from that segment, all of these segments you heard today on the podcast, and all the guests that are on Ion Northeast Kansas can be found on WIBW.com. I also share them on my Facebook page, which is WIBW Melissa Bruner, and you can find them on the Ion Northeast Kansas stream on our WIBW TV YouTube channel. Be sure to click subscribe while you are there. And thank you for listening in and subscribing to our Eye on Northeast Kansas podcast. Hope you have a great weekend, great week ahead, and we'll see you on the Red Couch.